Hello everyone, welcome to the first video on this new series at the Lincoln Home called Lincoln, Latinidad y el Midwest, a series to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Jorge Hernandez. I'm a park ranger at Lincoln Home National Historic Site in Springfield, Illinois. And for this first, first video, I want to talk about uh, a single event that uh, shaped the history of the United States but it also uh, affected the lives of many uh, Mexican people, Mexican-American, indigenous people in the Southwest. But to talk about this topic, I have a guest with me, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ranger Danny Ibarra from Palo Alto Battlefield. Welcome, Danny. How are you? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Pretty good. Awesome, awesome. So um, let's talk about uh, Latino history and let's talk about the U.S.-Mexico War. My first uh, question to you uh, is pretty much, where is Palo Alto Battlefield on the map? I'm not sure a lot of people know about this place. Uh, sure, you know, probably not. Um, well, to everybody out there, if you can imagine um, what Texas looks like, we are on the southernmost tip uh, of, of Texas, right, right on the U.S.-Mexican border uh, now. And, and that was the question back in 1846 is, you know, where the park is, you know, was this the U.S. or was this Mexico? Um, and that's that's in in large part what, what led to the, the battle that, that took place here at our site. This is the first major battle of the U.S.-Mexican War. It's the first time that uh, U.S. and Mexican armies have, have met in, in major combat. Uh, and that was due in, in, like I was saying, in large part because there's a dispute as to whether Texas had, you know, just become the independent country of Texas had just become part of the United States, or as uh, Mexico contended, the United States had essentially taken it or or stolen Texas from it, because uh, when when Texas claims independence in 1836, Mexico never officially recognizes that independence. Yeah. You know, they kind of always viewed it as this rogue or, or rebel state mm -hmm. that they would re later reclaim. And then there's even questions as to what the actual size of Texas was. Uh, you know, there was uh, this notion, you know, Mexico essentially, okay, if, if we're going to humor you and <laughs> assume that uh, you entered into a, a valid uh, a contract, you, you could say, uh, with Texas, uh, what Texas actually is is a lot smaller than what you think it is because the historical boundary of the southern boundary of Texas had been the Nueces River uh, and not the Rio Grande as the Texans were claiming. So you have a U.S. Army that's sent down here, led by Zachary Taylor. Mm -hmm. you know, the counter by Mexico is to uh, send Mariano Arista uh, into this area, into the, namely the area of the city of Matamoros, uh, with a Mexican force to kind of counter this move uh, and so you have two armies staring across the river at each other, and eventually, you know, an actual conflict boils over uh, right here uh, at Palo Alto Battlefield. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so after the Battle of Palo Alto, what happened? What happens is, you know, Polk does have a lot of support for the war initially uh, with with the public, mm -hmm. uh, but pretty quickly he starts to see that well, people are asking questions as to, you know, why why is the U.S. really entering into this war? Uh, mm -hmm. There is uh, a belief held by many that this was just a means to extend slavery uh, by acquiring these new territories. Uh, people start also asking, how are we paying for this? It starts mm -hmm. to get pretty expensive. Yeah. And so Pope sees, you know, I need to get in and out as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. But the only way to do that is to take Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And so you have this this third campaign led by Winfield Scott, uh, an amphibious assault on the city of Veracruz uh, in, I guess you could say the first D-Day. You, know, mm -hmm. you have a, a U.S. Navy landing, uh, a U.S. Army force along with some Marines on a foreign country. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're disembarking, they're laying siege to uh, Veracruz. And once that city falls, uh, the national highway is open straight, straight towards Mexico City. Uh, basically the path that Cortes took you know, several hundred years before. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually with the fall of Mexico City, you know, you have the, the Mexican army that's in disarray. 
the city has fallen this is September of 1847. At that point, then you have the, Me the US uh, government ask the Mexican government again, will you sell us this territory? <laughs> and yeah. so if you're the Mexican government, uh, your capital's fallen, it's taken, uh, your army's pretty much disbanded, and so you come to the negotiating table. And so in 1848, February of 1848, uh, you have the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, which is drafted and, and initially uh, signed by both parties. And it, it amounts to the transfer with, with the recognition of Texas as being U.S. territory, formal uh, declaration of that, and the sale of that California and Mexico territory. You have roughly about a million square miles that are added to the u.s in 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 the more personal level you know i can just imagine how people in the united states and mexico were viewing this war you know and it's interesting uh when you study this conflict i mean you look at u.s literature and it says u.s mexico war when you study the literature in mexico they call it you know la intervención americana or la invasión americana the u.s invasion of mexico you know so you have two yes. views you know of the conflict but even within the United States, you have people who are opposing the U.S.-Mexico war uh, because, um, you know, because it's dragging too long, as you mentioned, uh, which is a really good point. The war is just to acquire more land to become slave states, you know, so the, the issue of slavery was in interaction with the U.S.-Mexico war. Bringing it back to Illinois, for those of you watching, um, this is uh, when Abraham Lincoln comes into play, you know, because you have this young, um, you know, politician who by 1846, he was really looking to get a, into a national office. And finally, it happened for Abraham Lincoln in 1846. Finally got there. I mean, uh, it was surprising that he stood up, you know, and his first speech, his first resolutions was to speak against the U.S.-Mexico war, you know, a war that he believed and many others, you know, that it was an immoral uh, and unjust uh, war. He gave his famous spot resolutions, right? Because uh, what you, you brought it up, Danny, uh, the, the, the people uh, were questioning Polk, uh, who attacked first, you know? And according to President Polk, uh, U.S. blood uh, or American blood was shed in American soil, but Lincoln was, wait, so what's the actual spot where that happened? And then he gave, you know, eight resolutions to specifically call the historical geography of Texas, you know? He was known as, from then on, he was known as Spotty Lincoln, <laughs> you know, uh, because of his spot resolution. Going back uh, to the bigger picture of this conflict, Danny, uh, what do you think is the uh, the legacy of the U.S.-Mexico War? In, in a way, depending how you, you look at it, this is still an evolving situation yep. mm -hmm. uh, right. between the two countries. Uh, I mean, it was, it, it, for a lot of people, you know, right immediately after the war, I mean, you've got people that are finding themselves in, in U.S. territory, but they didn't actually move anywhere. It, it, it was that famous saying that, you know, we, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Yep. Uh, Aside from that, I mean, you have vast amounts of, of of, you, of territory it's added to the U.S. There's a wealth of resources uh, in, in the West now. Uh, and then shortly after this conflict, uh, you have the, the discovery of gold. Prior to this wrinkle of people that were leaving the East Coast and making, making their way West, but once gold is discovered, uh, you have this flood of, of people that are now making their way out West and, and through what eventually becomes the, the U.S. Midwest, uh, and so you have you have this legacy now, I guess you could say you have this legacy mm -hmm. of of all all of those uh, people that, that moved, you know, picked up their roots and set them down somewhere else that may not have done that had had this conflict not happened or had the the changes between the, the two countries not happened. And so that in itself, you know, you, you've changed. Um, you know, the makeup of the country that, you know, probably still existed today. Uh, you have, I mean, really with with this with this conflict, the creation of of the Mexican-American, uh, even even of that term. 
uh, because you know pre previous to that then didn't exist <laughs> you know uh, and so you you have this 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 kind of confluence of of ideas and 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 cultures that are you know in certain pockets of, of the country are, are still very strong there um you know it, it's uh you know i, I kind of tell people uh, it's hard to believe but when i was in high school i took art <laughs> and uh w one of the first things that that you learn in art is that the line is artificial that's a man-made thing mm -hmm. you know lines don't exist in the natural world mm -hmm. and so when you draw a line on a piece of paper namely a map and say okay from this day forward this is the u.s this is mexico uh in 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 a i guess you could say in a practical sense uh, that's not necessarily the case mm -hmm. you know it takes it takes a while for for any kind of changes to take place and sometimes maybe they don't this idea that because on such and such date you drew a line and mm -hmm. said this is now the u.s it is no longer Mexico. That does not mean that those traditions, uh, those called the language, even uh, that that just changed overnight. Um, and you know, with with how both countries end up developing after this conflict, uh, they take you know two very different paths towards towards development. Um, that still carries over today. You do have uh, people, quite a bit of people that that come to the U.S because of the opportunity that's here now uh, because of how the u.s developed and there's so many aspects of the u about the u.s mexico war that i'm glad you mentioned that it still continue on to this day you know uh we cannot uh study uh, uh or learn about um uh, latino history in the u.s or mexican american history in the u.s without talking about the u.s mexico war which started at Palo Alto battlefield, you know, uh, and, and, and what is now Bronzeville. But also the war impacted the Midwest um, uh, uh, with place with places that, that if you drive here in areas in the Midwest, you might notice, uh, for those of you watching, you might notice uh, special names, you know, uh, in, in your towns. <laughs> I mean, and I know you've done some work ar uh, around that, right, Danny? Yeah. Um, you know, we just uh, polished off an article that it, you contributed heavily to, <laughs> and we put it out there. But uh, yeah, and it it goes back to, you know, this 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 common thread that you know it's not specifically special to to this conflict, but oftentimes you you really don't know what's in your own backyard. Uh, and so when you when you have you know places let's take Iowa for instance uh, that is strewn with with county and town and 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 place names that tied directly to the war it was you know a, a township that had sent off you know uh, volunteers to go fight in the, in this conflict and so to I, to honor them you you know they're naming their new towns after battles and and places mm -hmm. in this war uh, and so it's, it's it's pretty interesting when you start digging around the the, the country in the Midwest, uh, and then you you see these these places uh, that you would think, what why is there a place named Buena Vista? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you also have here in Illinois specifically, you have uh, Cerro Gordo, which I'm pretty sure is pronounced differently here. <laughs> uh, uh, Danny, I think this was a really great conversation about the U.S. Mexico War. Uh, where can people find more information about Palo Alto and this conflict? Uh, for, for sure, our website. You know, if you look uh, look us up on, on on the internet, you know, visit the, the Palo Alto Battlefield uh, website or official website. Uh, we're pretty active on social media as well. Uh, but uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Ranger Danny uh, from Palo Alto once again for joining us on this first video on this new series we have for Hispanic Heritage Month called Lincoln, Latinidad y el Midwest. Uh, Danny, thank you so much uh, for joining uh, us at Lincoln Home. Uh, and for those of you watching, stay tuned for more videos throughout Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you very much.